So welcome everyone. Um, I'll hand over to Ayushi to start the proceedings. Hi everyone. Um, welcome everyone to this particular session, knowledge sharing session. And uh, we have Vishwanath today. But uh, before we talk about him, we'll a little bit talk about biome just to understand what we at Biome do. So at Biome Environmental Trust, our team members come from diverse group uh, backgrounds with varied interests, but are united by a very common goal to work together on projects that will benefit ideas around sustainable water and land management. A foundational value that anchors our work and org organizational culture is the respect for knowledge generated by lived realities, the social, ecological, economical of people and communities. Conversations with farmers, the water tanker wallas, the well diggers under a tree next to the lake becomes our university. So this is something I just picked up from our own website. And um, coming to Vishu, uh, for me, honestly, biome is equal to Vishwanath, but uh, we will still uh, just, I'll introduce Vishu in a very short, brief way that I can. So Vishwanath S. is the founder of Rainwater Club and director of Biome Environmental Solutions and trustee of Biome Environmental Trust. He's a civil engineer from Mysore University and a master's in urban and regional planning from CEPT and Dabad. And he holds a postgraduate diploma in urban environmental management from Rotterdam in Netherlands. A member of the Sustainable Sanitation Alliance, he's also an ex-secretary general of International Rainwater Catchment Systems Association. He serves as an professor at Azim Premji University and has been a columnist at the Hindu since 2007. And uh, we also know Vishu Vishwanath for his other name, which is the Zen Rain Man. And I thought uh, most of us do not know why it is Zen Rain Man. So when Vishu stuck two random words together to create a unique Gmail ID for himself, never would he have thought that it would become the moniker he would come to be known by the Zen Rain Man. Zen as in the Buddhist school of thought of which he is a vor voracious reader and Rain Man is one of his favorite movies of Dustin Hoffman's. So this is something about Vishu and uh, yeah Vishu it's. Oh yeah thanks thanks Aishi thanks and this is just a nice group uh, where we informally share uh, our experiences our interests so Happy to be here on a Friday afternoon and evening and uh, just share not a paper, not a thesis, but just some reflections on the engagements with the River Kaveri and what sense it makes to us as we work in Biome, but also to the general uh, society. Kaveri has been in the news for the dispute now that's going on between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. I'll touch upon it a bit briefly, try to examine what the causes are, not to sort of uh, name villains, but also to just sort of uh, think about why these uh, disputes arise and what, uh, how difficult it is to be able to find solutions to it and what does the present and the future looks like. So the talk is mostly you know, free-flowing stream of consciousness kind of things and so your indulgence and patience is requested. So the Kaveri is actually more than a river. For those of us who are uh, in, the, in the south who are part of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala or Pondicherry, Pondicherry, uh, for example, on the day of Tirtod Bhava, which occurs in October in uh, Kodugu, when the river is mythically said to come alive at uh, Talakaveri as a spring, um, the Kodavas go there in droves, as do many farmers from Tamil Nadu and from Karnataka, and pay their respects to this river as a point of origin. And the Kodavas not only uh, pay homage to the river there at Talakaveri, but even in their wells, in their homes. So Kaveri is uh, assumed to come in the form of water in their wells too and that respect is given by the by the Cordobas and by many people. 
In Tamil Nadu, it's the Pony, of course, the golden one, she who brings wealth, everything to us. And so it's covered is a sentiment, right? So it's that that is uh, uh, quite often reflected as in the headlines today, in uh, not the headlines in part of the newspaper today, where it says thousands bathe in the waste deep water at Mayala Dutra is Kaveri Tulakot Katam Tirthavari. So this this is uh, Mayala Dutra is in the delta area of uh, the Kaveri. And today, or uh, yesterday, when people stepped in into the Kaveri, they were hoping for uh, relief in the afterlife. So that's uh, the spiritual point of the river itself. It's cultural, spiritual life itself in, in this part of the world. Some interesting uh, vignettes around the Kaveri River. And as we come across, we'll see that uh, one of the things that's really been striking with the river water allocation or the way we perceive rivers is that I didn't know that the Hilsa was found in the Kaveri. And, and Ayushi, you're from uh, that part of the world which uh, respects the Hilsa as much as anything else which has to do with food. Yeah. So the Ilish was uh, actually all the way up to um, Trichy, right? It used to come all the way to Trichy. And so what's interesting also about uh, this phenomenon is that Previous to the construction of the lower Colorado Nanakat in 1836, right? So the damage to the ecology and the environment and the biodiversity of the river is very, very old. Uh, the lower uh, Colorado Nanakat built in 1836 actually stopped the Elish from coming all the way to Trichy. And now it, it cannot be found at all. So fascinating to read about it. Uh, that Elish, not only in Bangladesh and West Bengal, but and other parts of uh, the Indus, but also in the Kaveri too. Uh, so sometimes what we do to reverse is not reflected in uh, in the sheer numbers uh, of the quantities of water that's allocated between states. The damage is, is in cuts and uh, and wounds. So one of these is the lower uh, Kolerun Anikat, which is uh, an Anikat, it's just a small dam across the river. Uh, one other very interesting phenomenon has been the building of uh, uh, an anikat in Talakad, near Talakad, called the Madhav Mantri Anikat. And I'm not showing a figure on that, but the Madhav Mantri Anikat was perhaps in the 14th century. And uh, Professor Ganeshaya from the University of Agriculture Science argues uh, in a paper which he put in put out in Current Science that this anikat itself caused uh, the sand dunes of Talakad, the famous sand dunes of Talakad, to emerge because it exposed the river bank uh, completely, the water being held in the Anikat and being diverted uh, for irrigation purpose. And in some seasons, the river itself, the river bed was exposed. And so it caused these great sand dunes to come and bury the temples of Talkad, which are then excavated once in 12 years and uh, are famous. But it also caused the whirlpools at Talkad in the Kaveri River itself, which became the famous Malangi curse. There's a curse in Karnataka in Old Mysore, which talks of the fact that Malangi puts a curse on the king of Mysore, reputedly, and he, and she says, let the sand dunes, or let the Kaveri, let the, the let Talkad be buried under sand dunes, let there be whirlpools in the Kaveri at Talkad, and let the Mysore Maharaja not have children. Of course, Professor Ganeshaya argues that all three are human-made causes, and uh, the one that the Mysore Maharaja does not have progeny is also not true completely. But this is a famous uh, uh, sort of a curse or well-known um, myth uh, in, in this part of the world. So environmental destruction of the Kaveri is perhaps dated to the 14th century too, not just the 19th century, but the 14th century, where any intervention in the river causes uh, consequences. And we've still not learned that uh, tampering with the river flow uh, is, is fraught with externalities, as you would call it. There's the Kaveri itself, one of the oldest uh, rivers in India. Most of the land formation here is between 66 million to 100 million years old in geological time. So these are part of the four South Indian uh, major rivers. Uh, you see number five there, written in bold, that's the Kaveri. They're starting in the Brahmagiri Hills and going all the way to Pumpuhar, where it meets the river, uh, where it meets the sea. So in terms of the watershed of, uh, of Karnataka itself, the Kaveri does not occupy a significant portion. It's the Krishna Basin, which is the largest basin, and the west-flowing rivers of Karnataka, which actually 
uh, carry the largest volume of flows, but the Kaveri is at the very heart or at the very soul, though it would be about 20%, 23% of Kanaga's uh, overall watershed area or even less. But uh, it has very strong significance because it comes from a past when the past uh, for the Mysore Kingdom and for Kodagu, Kaveri was critical itself. Then when later on Karnataka was amalgamated, actually Kodagu itself became part of what uh, was what was to become Karnataka. It has assumed a very strong political and uh, water connect with, with us, though it's not really the dominant volume of water in our state, yet it has very particular significance for us. And that's the origin in the Brahmagiri Hills of the Kaveri, Tal, uh, Kaveri where, uh, as I was talking about, uh, it is reputed, it is believed that a spring emerges every October on the on a particular day called Tirthod Baba Day, Kaveri Sankarmana, Tula Sankarmana, as it is called, the Hindu calendar. Lots of pilgrims go and pay their respects here. And so here I should uh, just sort of pause and also mention one particular fact, which is of great interest to me, that previous to about 30, 40 years, in the 70s, for example, there would be more people from Tamil Nadu coming to, to this place as much as people from Kodagu, but more people from Tamil Nadu than, than the rest of Mysore or Karnataka visiting the place because of the significance that Kaveri has had for both Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. And one of the uh, mentions in a book called Eternal Kaveri goes that when the rains fail in Tanjavur, which is in the Delta area, the farmers of uh, the Delta area used to pray and the prayer in Tamil was for rains in, in uh, Markara or Madikeri. So they did not pay, pray for rains in their own part, but they prayed for rains in Madikeri. This is uh, Janki Raman and Chitti's book called Eternal Kaveri, which sort of documents this particular story. So the significance of the origin of a river, for all uh, hydrologists, the origin of a river is the place farthest away from the sea in the river basin, right? So that's the technical description, but in terms of spiritual and cultural connects, it's all associated with myths of springs, of places of holiness and prayer. And this is some of the beautiful uh, uh, parts of the Kaveri, no longer existing even now. These photographs are also slightly old. They are more than 10 years, and they've got ugly flyovers and stupid constructions all over the place. This is Bhagamandala, where the Kaveri's first tributaries come and meet her. That's the Kanika and the invisible Sujyoti. So groundwater is always being seen as some sort of an invisible flow which enters rivers. And one of the ways that rivers have been fed is through base flows. Base flows where aquifers are high, where groundwater goes in, in, into the into the shallow aquifer dominantly, and the shallow aquifer then feeds the river. Otherwise, the rivers are themselves fed in only four months of a year. And most rivers, therefore, depend for their summer flows on base flows, which comes from groundwater. And the first groundwater could have could perhaps be uh, appreciated by the old people in the form of Sujoti, the invisible one, which comes and meets uh, you know, uh, the Kaveri at Bagmandla, the first place where the tributaries come. And so the Kaveri itself has some wonderful uh, tributaries, the Lakshman Tirtha, the Shimsha, the Arkavati, the Kabini, and so on. So many, many tributaries go, go on to make the mighty river, which then meets the sea. The tributaries are often underestimated. So sometimes uh, it is good to focus on the tributaries and see what do they mean to the main river stem and what could be done in the sub-basins of the tributaries, for example, the Hemavati or the Kabini, which are uh, actually carrying large volumes of flows, which adds to the Kaveri's flows itself. And therefore, when we talk of basin management, it could also be talked about in terms of sub-basin management and understanding the particular characteristics of these major tributaries and working with them to make sure that their perenniality, that their quality of water and quantity of water are all managed. And so this is what we talk about, the confluence of tributaries with the mighty river and the tributaries being as important. And what you see are two rivers joining, that's the Kanika and the Kaveri meeting together at Bagmandla. Uh, some photographs of the Brahmagiri Hills, the Western Ghats. So this is the eastern parts of the Western Ghats and particular characteristics of the rivers of India, except the Narmada, is they flow from the Western Ghats all the way to the Bay of Bengal. Most rivers do that, which is fascinating. And you see that the Brahmagiri Hills at the background are part of the Western Ghats. And the, they, these are sort of sacred spaces, which uh, are ecologically rich biodiverse spaces, which are the homes of the rivers, where rivers originate. 
And so there are very interesting stories around uh, what happens then when uh, the river is itself confronted is with what we call development or growth. And one of that uh, is uh, the fascinating tale for me of the identification of gold in Kolar, uh, the discovery of gold, and then therefore the digging for gold at Kolar gold fields. This started in the 1890s. And in uh, the 1890s, Champion Reef, Kolar gold fields, and the Kolar gold mines were some of the deepest mines where gold was gold had to be found. And ironically, when you dig deep, groundwater comes in into the mines and they have to be pumped out. And using uh, steam engines or diesel engines, when volumes of water are very huge, is impossible. So therefore, there's the need for electricity. And so the KGF was promised electricity uh, power by the then Mysore government. And the, the first uh, hydroelectric plant, which therefore started the use of the river as a source of agriculture and as a source of electricity, was put up in Shivan Samudram. And in 1902, 1903, the line which ran from Shivan Samudram, which is um, close to Kanakpura, uh, was one of the longest lines, in the, was the longest line in the world, which took electricity to go large gold fields. So here begins... Uh, the river itself and its engagement with uh, with energy and with electricity. And Shivan Samudram, Divan Shashadri Ayer is a famous Divan who sort of uh, made sure that this electric hydroelectric project was taken up. The electricity from here first reached KGF, then it went to the Mysore Palace, then it came to Bangalore, and Bangalore streetlights were lit with uh, electricity thanks to the Kaveri. And Bangalore's association uh, with the Kaveri began with Shivan Samudram, not directly with the river waters that we took there, but with the electricity generated at this particular place. And of course, that the, that electricity then went to the Kavati River, a place called Esargatta, from where water was pumped to the city. But that's a later story. So here's KGF coming up, and then Shivan Samudram being built to provide power to KGF so that gold could be mined. Then comes the fact that... Uh, the Shivan Samudram, the river flows become very low during summertime and uh, they're not able to generate enough electricity as promised to the private uh, players of the KGF. And therefore, there begins the talk of a dam. And that is the sort of genesis of the KRS dam or the Krishna Raj Sagara dam. It starts with the need to ensure water flows which will generate hydroelectricity and go to KGF and enable digging of gold there. So KRS Dam is then conceptualized as early as 1911 foundation work starts, then there's protracted negotiations with Tamil Nadu, and then finally it get, gets built in the 1930s. But the genesis of the dam is for ele electricity generation, not for agriculture, as we assume. Later on, of course, it assumes this, uh, the shape of it being a multipurpose project, multipurpose project in the sense that it will release summer flows for electricity generation at Shivan Samudram and that waters will be used in the canals for agriculture, making Mandya and Mysore area one of the most fertile areas in, in the Kaveri Delta. That's the river herself. She has three stages. One is in Kodagu where it's a rapid descent where there are small dams built and then there's the mid region where till it hits uh, the dam at Maitur, and from then on, it becomes the floodplain. So three major regions, and this is just below Shiv Samudram, where the river still is flowing, but it's not really a large volume flow because already dams have held on to her waters, but the flow is slightly rapid enough. And somewhere down below is the promised Mekedatu Dam, which will save Bangalore forever from water scarcity and will, of course, drown a lot of the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. But as you can see on both sides uh, of, the, of the river are forests and at the point of time when the, uh, when the Shivan Samudram hydroelectricity project was built, uh, engines came from Westinghouse and from uh, the USA and uh, it came from UK and they were actually transported on elephants to this particular place near the river so that the hydroelectric project itself could be started. So fascinating constructs around that. There are other constructs like this particular bridge across uh, uh, the river in uh, Shirampatna. This is called the Wellesley Bridge or the Hale Setwe in Karnataka, in Kannada Old Bridge. This followed the Fifth Anglo-Indian War where Tipu Sultan was killed in Shirampatna, and uh, but the bridge was destroyed by Tipu himself to safeguard Shirampatna. Therefore, the first thing that the British had to do was to resume connectivity with Shirampatna. They built this bridge out of granite and stone in 1804. The bridge was built before the KRS dam was built. And so therefore this bridge has seen the Kaveri in spate when there were no dams upstream. So at points of time, the bridge has been sub uh, submerged, yet the bridge survives. And it's uh, sort of a marvelous civil engineering heritage that we have here, built purely out of stone, granite stone slabs. 
and which still continues to be able to carry load from 1804 to now. The famous Divan of uh, Tipu Sultan, who then became the Divan to the King of Mysore, Divan Purnaya, inaugurated this bridge and the bridge costed about five and a half lakh rupees at that point of time for five and a half lakh rupees. The old Hale Setwe or Wellesley Bridge was built across the Kaveri. It's interesting that uh, uh, rivers have been seen as the uh, sort of uh, beds of civilization. Great cities come up uh, on the banks of rivers. However, the British found the climate of Sri Patna hostile. There was malaria, there was disease, and therefore they abandoned Sri Patna and came to Bangalore. And Bangalore became the metropolis that it now is with about 14 million people. And the biggest uh, urban area around the Kaveri is still Mysore with, with a far less population. And so therefore, it's strange that in the Kaveri Basin, the biggest metropolis of them all is actually on a ridge line up on the up on the hills rather than close to the river and therefore has to depend on the river for its uh, waters. Well, this, uh, it's also uh, a place for contemplation, the Kaveri itself, and then Kaveri, um, when it becomes the Paschim Vahini, where, where it starts to flow west, uh, it assumes greater spiritual significance. And in places uh, where people die, their ashes are then left into the river itself as a holy place for it to be transported for releasing the soul from the journey of birth and rebirth and not giving moksha to them. So the Kaveri is the Dakshin Ganga in most senses. So it's as holy as the Ganga for the Hindus who believe in the river and who have the spirituality. And this is one place where ashes are put to the river itself. And then there is the sort of the, the beauty of sand mining, if you can call it that. So it's a death by a thousand cuts and nicks, though there's large scale sand mining, which occurs in the plains of Tamil Nadu, where the, where the river itself has a large uh, bed and has lots of sand. Here in the Shimsha, for example, you see these uh, large vessels being used by ordinary farmers to get a bit of sand for themselves and perhaps to sell it, sometimes to build their own house, but sometimes to also put it to the commercial place because sand is now such a valuable commodity in Mysore, in Bangalore, where in urban areas where sand is atrociously highly priced. So uh, the, the difference between livelihoods with the river as a provider and then large scale commercial exploitation is a very thin one and it quickly transcends from one to the other. The features of the Kaveri Basin itself is there in the website. You can pick it up from WRIS. So it's uh, it's a catchment area of 81,155 square kilometers. The length is 800 kilometers. The average water potential, and this is fascinating, that's only about 26% of the total rain that falls in the river basin actually reaches the river. So it's about 74% which does not reach the river. And therefore, our imagination of that 74% now will have to become more robust as to what we do with the 74% if you have to overcome the shortages created by this 26% which reaches the river and which has to be shared, right? So there's some statistics on this. Look at the population. The population estimated in the Kaveri Basin in 2001, where we have the reliable data and there is uh, an estimated growth, was 32 million in 2001. Now, at a decadal growth rate of about 11%, which was then the 92, 91 to 2001 decadal growth rate, it could be about 40 billion, though some other estimates put it at a very high 73 million. So it's not very clear as to where uh, the population growth is, is happening. But you can be clear that the only area where it's urban and where there's a highly dense population is Bangalore up there on the ridge line. You can see that as a brown figure. Broadly, the basin is agricultural with small urban areas, Sela, Miro, Trichy, Tanjavur, etc., Mysore. But dominantly, the only metropolis which is now growing rapidly is, is Bangalore. So if you were to take the population of the Kaveri as 40 million or even, or even if you took the higher figure of 70 million as it does. And then if you say that Bangalore is 14 million people, nearly 20% of the population of the Kaveri, entire Kaveri Basin is in this one metropolis, which is Bangalore, which is actually not completely in the Kaveri Basin. Only about a half of it is in the Kaveri Basin. The other half is in the Dakshin Pinakini Basin. And that's a strange uh, situation. The urban sprawl, not being close to the river, being far away from the river and being the fastest uh, metropolis, therefore demanding a bit of water. So this is the sort of basin areas, uh, which you can see here. Uh, Tamil Nadu, of course, has the largest basin area. Karnataka is a close second. Then there's Kerala and Puducherry. 
the drought area, of course, the higher drought area is in Karnataka as compared to Tamil Nadu because Karnataka is a very drought prone state. And even the parts of Tumkur, which dominate uh, the, the Kaveri Basin in Karnataka, is heavily drought prone. The inflow in the, from the basin in TMC, you can see that Tamil Nadu has 252, uh, Karnataka has 425 TMC as the net uh, contributor to the catchment up to the basin. And the share of waters is, of course, higher for Tamil Nadu and uh, slightly lesser for Karnataka is 419, 270 as the share of allocation. This is the tribunal's allocation, as of course, a lot. Uh, the land use land cover statistics, which I've again picked up from the WRIs, is also fascinating. It's a hugely agricultural basin. As you can see, 66.21% of the, of the overall basin is agricultural. The built-up land, which would necessarily be urban areas and rural habitations, it's only about 4%. Forest land is 20%, grassland is 1.33%, and wasteland, which would actually be grassland, which is a nomenclature which WRIS has, is 3.86%. So if you take the grassland, uh, the wasteland is essentially grassland or open scrubland or open land as it's now called. The total is uh, is close to 5% 5, 5 of it. And the water bodies are 4%. And the water bodies are essentially tanks, which are human-made structures. And of course, there are streams and rivers to add to it. But a dominantly agricultural uh, uh, basin, as can be expected for most basins. And then you see that the, that the forest lands are, as shown in green, are in the fringes of the Western Guards on the left. There's a big chunk in the middle, which is the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary, and that stretch uh, which, which occurs there. And the, the rest of it is agricultural land, which is the brown land. And you see these splotches of, uh, of red or brown, which are the urban areas, Bangalore being a dominant one there, up there. So that's the basin for you. And one another interesting fact is that the basin itself, in terms of the allocation, has been considered only to slow call their own because it's very difficult at the deltaic area of the basin to understand whether it's part of the basin or not, because the river itself splits into myriad streams, aided, of course, by the Grand Anicut and the Lower Anicut. And it, it becomes three major uh, streams there, um, Venar, Kolarun, and Kaveri itself, but then many, many, many substreams as they then join the sea. So, the, so this is a particular characteristic of the Kaveri that in the Deltaic region, one of the most fertile regions there, that the river itself splits into many. Through, uh, <coughs> there was a phenomenal increase in the um, cultivation of rice in the 80s and 90s. But what this is a paper by ORF, Jayanta Bhattopadhyaya, Nilanjan Mukherjee, etc. And it's a very nice paper. It's a, worth the read, the one uh, which I mentioned in the reference there. It points out that the that this increase in cultivation of rice happened in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, both in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka. Of course, Karnataka being the upper riparian state and putting more land into cultivation, Tamil Nadu had stabilized with its rice cultivation, meant that Karnataka's rice cultivation area increased much, much more proportionately, though as a total, it's still less than that of Tamil Nadu. However, it came at the cost of Jawar being given up, Bajra more or less being given up, maize, well, it's there as fodder, uh, as a crop. Ragi has shown us a substantial decline. Sugarcane has also shown a decline, which is perhaps a nice thing there. But paddy uh, has shown the most increase in the 70s, 80s, and up to the 90s. But later on, now it's stabilized in both states, the area under cultivation under paddy. One of the interesting factors here is the impact of the green revolution on this particular form of cultivation, because... The, when in the 60s, the new variety of, of rice, IR6, came in, or uh, what was a variety which was brought from Taiwan, which was brought in into India. And the first place where this high yielding variety rice was tried out was, of course, in the Tanjavur belt, because the, there the farmers had the maximum knowledge about rice cultivation. And that rice cultivation of the high yielding variety mean, meant that the water demand actually shot up with the high yielding variety. Uh, as uh, HYV rice was used, and water being not priced or water being generally available at very subsidized prices from canals or from groundwater, it meant that the water use exploded. And therefore, there seems to be a potential for uh, aerobic rice, for systematic rice intensification, if tried out well and if accepted by farmers, to considerably release water allocations for other consumptions or actually to de-stress it. So rice and uh, uh, working with rice in terms of how rice can be cultivated with less water or how it can be done better uh, in terms of crop production offers the, the best opportunity for water savings in this particular uh, basin. 
So here's the tribunal itself um, coming to a decision. And one of the fact is that uh, the tribunal's decision is only on water allocation. It's nothing to do with the river itself or the catchment of the basin. It just takes a look at the uh, water flows in the river, puts an average and says that 50% flows is 726 TMC, and it divides it up between the states. It says 30 TMC available for Kerala, 270 TMC for Karnataka, which was then increased by the Supreme Court to 284.75, as you see on the right, and the Tamil Nadu share appropriately there, and Pondicherry, because it depends in the basin area for some water, so 7 TMC. Then there are two mentions, which you can see on the left below. There's a quantity reserved for environmental protection, which is put as 10 TMC, and it's not clear as to where, who, and what is using this 10 TMC of water. And there's a quantity determined as inevitable escapage into the sea, which is 4 TMC, as to any water going into the sea is, is a waste. So that's the uh, notion that's uh, driven our river tribunals with the Interstate Water Dispute Act of 1956. Tribunals have looked at utilizing all waters for agricultural allocation dominantly, but also for urban and industrial use. That's been the nature of things. And I think somewhere along the line, we'll have to reconstruct our law and the river management framework, whereby we will have to start to recognize that ecological and environmental flows are essential, that there's no such thing as a loss to the sea, that there is some water that has to reach the sea, if not much of the water. And therefore, the dominant narrative, as uh, the late uh, Dr. Ramaswamy Ayer was a doyen of uh, water, would put it that the river has the first right to water and then whatever human allocations and appropriations we do should come after the river's rights is established. It's the other way around. Right now, we look at it from a human allocation perspective. We think of divvying up all waters and using it all completely. There's nothing left for the river itself or for the myriad creatures which occupy the river and the physical, chemical, and biological needs of the river are sim simply left untouched by the tribunal and its decision, and even by the Supreme Court. So then the famous uh, dictum that in case the yield of the Kaveri Basin is less in a distress year, the allocated shares will proportionately reduced among the states of Kerala. Now, this proportionate reduction is not clearly articulated. There's no distress formula, even by the current CWMA, the Kaveri Water Management Authority, and that's become the cause for friction and this kind of tension between the two states of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, because we're still not clear what is a distress year, when should a distress year be declared, how then will the flows be divided, especially when Karnataka is faced with the situation that uh, the southwest monsoon stops in late September, at best uh, early October, at which point of time it has to take a call on how to release waters to Tamil Nadu, whereas the rains of the Northeast will then start to arrive at Tamil Nadu. And as we speak, there are portions of the Delta where rice cultivation is being uh, fraught with consequences for farmers. Farmers are facing terrible losses because there's flooding in the fields, not adequate drainage, right? Because the Northeast monsoon has hit this part uh, very much. So this sort of definition of the distress, the proportionality of distress, how it should be shared, will be a matter of uh, much debate and discussions. And unless a consensus is arrived at, we will continue year on year, wherever there's a fall below the average or normal to face these conflicts that we are facing now. So it doesn't look like it's going to be sorted out easily. And this is the monthly releases, uh, which is based on a 50% rainfall. As you can see, the final award, the TMC as allotted by the tribunal, it, they don't not only specify how much water should be released in a year, but also specify that it should be monthly. And within month, even there's a 10-day release, which is, uh, which is prescribed. Now, this begs the question, Tamil Nadu always starts to demand this much of release, and Karnataka keeps saying that this is a below average year, so therefore it's a distress year. So this sort of intractable difference of opinion is what causes uh, the conflict to come up. So the tribunal itself and the river itself is the subject of uh, law. So lawyers and advocates decide what a river should, the sharing should be as the legal framework of a country of the constitution demands. And there are two doctrines which are at uh, play. One is the doctrine of prior appropriation, which means that somebody who is already using water claims the right to that water based on the fact that they historically they've been using it consistently. And that's Tamil Nadu's claim that they've been using the water historically for a long time. And then there's the new claimant, the new upper uh, riparian state, which now starts to increase its agricultural area and which starts to argue that historically it uh, has been suffering a loss because it 
was not allowed to use the water. And there the claim is based on something called the Harmon's Doctrine, Harmon being the Secretary of State of the United States at some point of time in history, who started to argue that every drop of water that falls on on any land, in that particular case in the USA, on the USA, belongs to the USA. And there's no necessity for it to be released to a river or for any downstream state. So, of course, the negotiation has to be between this prior appropriation and Harmon's Doctrine. Something called the Helsinki Principles have been arrived at. And that Helsinki Principle starts to put a midway path between the uh, doctrine of prior appropriation and Harmon's Doctrine. Not very successfully in many cases, but that's the protracted negotiations that have to occur uh, that have to occur and so legal frameworks and legal uh, ways of finding solutions have to address these two you know doctrines and come to a consensus as to what we think is appropriate for india otherwise tribunal's decisions will all be contested in the supreme court the supreme court itself is not supposedly to be able to act because the tribunal's decision is supposed to be final in terms of the interstate water dispute acts but when the supreme court takes on itself the responsibility for a final decision, there's nobody who can say no to them. And therefore, the Supreme Court perhaps will have to articulate as will Parliament as to how river waters will have to be shared and how distress will be shared and how there will be waters for the river itself and how the rights of the river will be recognized. These are all work in progress. Now comes the one of the sort of uh, prevailing myths about a metropolis and a cavalry, and that's what... Uh, the Kaveri through the Brishpavati and Arkavati and to the right is the Dakin Petakan. So the city sits on a ridge line and the tribunal in fact suggested that um, only one third of Bangalore was entitled to any allocation of the Kaveri river waters because the tribunal's decision was based on hydro, um, hydrology and river basin networks. It took the Supreme Court to work in that and said that there is something called prior appropriation and you cannot leave out Bangalore entirely from the river basin of the Kaveri and only allocate some waters to a, one third of the population. So therefore, in, in, in legal terms now, Bangalore is very much a part of the Kaveri basin. So that's the way it is. And it is the densest population and one of the highest population, as you as you note, for any particular geographical space in the entire basin. And so its water, therefore, comes from the uh, from Torekard in Adli, uh, 95 kilometers away. It draws water. And then it uses the water. Luckily, urban water use uh, is not a consumptive use. Unlike, let's say, if you grow rice or sugarcane, where the water use is consumptive, where it's evaporated to a large extent. In urban use, about 80 to 90 percent of the water, roughly calculated at 80 percent, becomes available as used water or wastewater, as we call it, is available for cleaning up and reusing itself, which is what is the attempt in Bangalore. Can it clean up all its waters? The 1,450 million liters per day it draws from the Kaveri, 600 million from, uh, from the groundwater. And can that water then be uh, again reused by farmers? Of course, in this particular case, it's being transferred mostly to Kolar and Chikbalapur, which is in the Dakshin Pinakne and Palar Basin. So does the right of water, wastewater, lie with the basin itself or can it uh, be transferred to other areas would be legal contestations which would emerge in the future? So one other thing that uh, needs a bit of clarification is that uh, the consumption of water by Bangalore City is only about uh, 19 TMC feet now, which will become 30 TMC feet, 1,000 million cubic feet by the end, by next year, by March, when the Kaveri fifth phase comes into play. So that's about 6.67% of Karnataka's allocation of water. And with that 6.67% of Karnataka's allocation of water, it's able to support roughly... 50% of Karnataka's population in the Kaveri Basin. And as we saw, about 20% of the overall Kaveri Basin population itself is being supported by the 6.67% use. Not to mention the GDP that is generated, the gross domestic project or the economic use which the city generates, the, which then provides the taxation base for schools, public health, hospitals, everything for the state of Karnataka. So therefore, my argument would be that cities are actually very efficient users of water. They, they, the right to water for every citizen of, uh, of the city is no less than that of any rural person. The city has the ability to invest in cleaning up these waters if it so decides. And when it cleans up its wastewater, it uh, therefore has the potential of providing it for agricultural use or ecological use or even industrial urban use. Therefore, cities coming up in a river basin and the urbanization of the, of the river basin perhaps uh, is a solution to the entire uh, allocation issue. And as Tamil Nadu also urbanizes, Tamil Nadu is one of the most urbanized states in India. And as Karnataka in the Kaveri Basin urbanizes, the, the 
the need for agricultural water may stabilize and therefore uh, there may be with the better use and better efficient use of crops grown and water there, perhaps there lies this opportunity to be able to sort out this mess, which is the Kaveri. And that is also, there's also a reason for this because the drought and famines have been great drivers of what we call dam construction and canal construction in India. Droughts and famines which come consecutively as they did in Bangalore in 1876, 77, 78 and caused the death of nearly 100,000 people, 95,000 to 100,000 people in what was then the old Mysore kingdom, with a lot of them dying in Bangalore, meant that the local water resources, which was the tanks and wells, were not sufficient to then support a population of what was about 1.5 lakh people in Bangalore. So this sort of myth or this environmental narrative that local waters will be able to be sufficient to provide for the city has to be addressed by the fact that in climate change and during eras of drought, it may not be possible for local waters to support, especially a population which is 14 million projected to be 18 million to 20 million. And that local waters are necessary from an ecological, social, cultural perspective, but may not be seen as depend as the only dependable source for drinking water and for requirement of domestic water use. And therefore, they have to be a major supplement that may be fitted in into an ecological environmental paradigm, but not from a drinking water paradigm. So therefore, what it means is that the city which consumes water from the river should also start taking responsibility for the catchment area, that is to say, Kodugu and Wainat. And the city's responsibility is not only to its lakes and tanks alone, which it should show more responsibility but it should also start to think about what it does in terms of the river basin itself and see what can be done in protecting the forest, the old growth forests of, of Kodagu, of Vainad, of the Hemavati Basin, Sacheshpur and other areas. So protracted naval gazing does not help a city. And therefore, this is why the alignment of Bangalore with Kaveri has to be defined differently and should be the engagement should be different from what it is now. And of course, technology was the great user of water. Steam engines were used from Hesargatta. So Hesargatta is on the Arkavati River, which is part of the Kaveri Basin. So from 1896 itself, Bangalore city started to use the Kaveri waters, the Kaveri Basin waters. And that's a prior appropriation case to be made, made out using steam engines, the water came in. And it's the Hesargatta waters and the Thitgundanali waters and the Kaveri waters, which keeps Bangalore alive. More people consume Kaveri waters in Bangalore city than any other place, including Kodagu, which itself has a population of five lakhs. Bangalore the connection is 1.1 million connections, where, which means roughly about 10 to 12 million people are using Kaveri waters every, every time they open the tap and water comes in through the tap. So the dams on the Kaveri have actually been on quite an increasing speed. We now have about 101 dams on the Kaveri and its tributaries. The movement was from Anikats, Anikats which were small diversion um, devices, small barrages uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the river, which sort of diverted the river waters almost parallel to the river and not to great distances. But now we have dams which have great command areas and where more than one lakh hectares is under irrigation and cultivation in many of these, from many of these dams which are coming up. So this dam construction has, KRS was the largest urban dam of its kind when it was built. Metur was one of the largest dams of, when it was built of its kind. So these large, uh, grandiose technological projects, which have provided succor to many, have also meant that the river has been stressed. This is Metur, beautiful site. This is when the dam, when the river hits the plain. So sometimes people argue, why doesn't Tamil Nadu build dams? It can't because there is no other place for it to build dams. Metur is the last point on the plains where it can build a dam. Beyond Metur, it can only build anikats and barrages. It can't do it can't do large dams. So this is the last favorable place on the river for the dam. And upstream of Metur is, of course, the famous Make It Data project, which is there. So this beautiful sites, which reservoirs create, may look glorious, but are actually obstructions on the river and are large impoundments of water. So what about the future? I mean, so this was sort of uh, the trail of what uh, one was discussing. It's the nature of development and actually agricultural development, which has caused uh, stress on the river basin. Uh, ecology and environment have not been parts of the discussion at all. We, we need to figure about it much more. Local waters and uh, water recycling and water reuse has to come in, in, in 
far greater numbers than what is being attempted. All the tanks in the uh, in the in the basin itself, the tanks which are the human made lakes which are being constructed, need to be put into full functionality because they have many purposes. One of them is of course to hold on to rainwater. Remember the seventy four percent of rainwater which does not reach the river, that's there as green water which is available in these tanks more locally. These tanks can recharge shallow aquifers and deeper aquifers, which is what we need to look for. How do we recharge them? And we have to live within means of whatever nature provides us at that particular geography, yet not deprive farmers of livelihoods and aspirational needs of, of economic growth. And that will come perhaps through a much more recent debate than that of between states. So what is the unit of uh, debate that should occur? How should that uh, debate occur? And who should be part of the discussion to find solutions? Uh, most unlikely that it will come from lawyers or it can come from courts. It will have to be a much more societal discussion and societal approach to solution finding, um, which is perhaps where the future lies at. So happy to take questions and happy to be part of the discussion that you want to be part of. Yeah. I'm... Thank you so much, um... Thank you for this very, very interesting talk, Vishwa, sir. Uh, uh, those who would like to ask questions, uh, you can put up your hand and then you can unmute and switch on your video and ask the question. So when Apeksha says that's a good point, what, what do you mean? Which point was good, Apeksha? Apeksha, you can unmute and switch on your video and respond. Apeksha? And she's dropped off. Go ahead, Apeksha. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, the point that uh, the urbanization will yield to a good, uh, uh, good management of a river is what you were telling, right? That that's when I told that it's a good point. Yeah. So, uh, picture it's actually good urbanization, right? And planned urbanization and investment in wastewater management and investment in resource flows has the potential to be able to be transformative if we do it well. If we don't yes. do it well, we will end up polluting our streams and rivers and lakes, which we seem to be doing with great efficiency right now, right? Yes, true, sir, true. Any other questions? Yes, Krishna, go ahead. Uh, thanks. I think it was a wonderful session, very enlightening for me at least. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, you know, um, there seems to be slowly a realization that, you know, a lot of things need to be thought of uh, in a in a, con in a consolidated manner, in the sense that the government bodies and you know the way uh, everything comes together and planning needs to happen at a much co in a much coordinated manner, but the speed at which it happens is probably very very slow. And by the time somebody, I mean, multiple many of these organizations and bodies come together, think of land use, water use, you know, farmers and everything. Maybe somebody like you, who is already a part of this government body, understands the urgency. But is there a translation of that urgency or an understanding of that urgency at the ground level? Are people moving fast enough? Or I mean, it, if, because if we continue to move at this rate, um, it it will probably be too late. So just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, Krishna, that's a, a valid point. I think uh, all change is slow and transformational change is slow. But you can see, for example, that in the city of Bangalore, many groups are working towards lake restoration, lake rejuvenation, pollution prevention, solid waste management, right? So there's a built up narrative on cleaning up the environment. Uh, with river basins, with legal frameworks, with institutional frameworks, we've been terribly slow. At the national level, thanks to many people, especially Mir Shah and other committees. We, for the first time, integrated many of the water departments into what's called the Ministry of Jal Shakti. For the first time, groundwater and surface water ministries have all come together into one place, right? So that was, that was a much more, better chance of unified planning. But still, the worldview remains that of, of use, right? Of development is uh, defined by 6-7% GDP, which means consumptive use. We have to alter that paradigm, and that's a, that's a big challenge for us. In India, the big challenge, of course, as you point out is that we need to get a lot of people away out of poverty up the income ladder yet at the same time conserve our environment and our institutions so farmers are a critical community who are struggling to earn a decent livelihood so therefore their interests have to be protected but at the same time we need to protect the rivers and the environment and the forest themselves so so are we able to do things fast enough unfortunately not especially in the rough climate change it's unfortunately getting worse by the day what is needed as you 
correctly point out is that we need now as citizen advocacy groups, as people who are interested in the sector to move away from the band-aid argument of cleaning up one lake, to look at structural changes which will be necessary to make those arguments better, right? For now, we've been arguing, let me clean up my lake or my river or my stream or my street, right? Uh, we have to look at the governance and figure out what needs to be done with governance so that the governance is capable of delivering what society needs and what society wants. It's a big battle. It's a big battle. One mm -hmm. of the things that... Yeah. yeah go ahead. Go ahead, Uma. So one of the things I forgot to mention is that groundwater was not considered as part of the tribunal water sharing itself. Till the Supreme Court stepped in and said that there is 10 TMC of groundwater available in the Delta. So we have to figure out how uh, groundwater, surface water, what we call integrated urban water management or integrated water resource management also comes into play to alleviate the burden on, on surface water. But what we're doing with groundwater is we're also actually overutilizing it. So we have to think through how we use groundwater better. Just prompted a question. Are there any areas um, where we, I probably groundwater usage along the Kaveri River itself is probably not as much as it is in Bangalore. But are there any instances of where the river has suffered because of groundwater extraction? So, for example, Uma, the Arkavati, which is a significant uh, contributor to the Kaveri, has dried up essentially because of over-extraction of groundwater and the plantation of eucalyptus in its catchment. So that's Arkavati. You can say that the same thing is happening with the Lakshman Tirtha. The same thing uh, is happening with the Lok Pavani. So these are local cuts and uh, wounds which we don't notice on the main river itself. But the main river is being impacted by the first order, second order, third order streams, all drying up due to overexploitation of groundwater and the cultivation of, of, of trees like eucalyptus. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Juhi, go ahead. Hi, Vishu, sir. So uh, this is a question from all of us here, sitting here, listening to you, that what kind of uh, investments or interventions uh, Bangalore needs to do. In upstream areas, in, like poor environment. Well, it's Okay. In upstream areas, like you mentioned about Kur, Gwan, and those. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one of the things uh, which uh, we have to think about is something called the payment for ecological services, right? So it could be that we need to start to invest in cities like New York have done it where they have bought up forest, old forests and in the Catskill Mountains, and there's nothing allowed, no tourism also allowed in that Catskill Mountains. It's kept as a pristine nature reserve for, um, for clear water to flow. So which means that New York actually needs un no treatment plant for its water to a large extent. And the Catskill Mountain water is so clear, pure, and pristine that it comes into New York City, right? So that's the one extreme of it all. But investment in Kodagu to, to make sure that the old forests are protected is crucial for us. How do we do it? I don't know, but uh, we can't leave it for uh, for rampant destructions through unbridled tourism now and with plantations also playing uh, its role, who are mostly citizens of Bangalore who are doing this kind of investment there now, right? So it can't be a destructive relationship. It has to be a positive relationship. It will have to be defined by protecting those areas from landslides, from exploitation and keeping it as natural as possible. I don't know whether I've answered it completely. It's it's still imperfect, but this is work in progress. I, I, is there a question being asked, Sharad? Are you asking something? No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's that uh, there will be negotiations then between different geographical regions. No, it, it's not Correct. as simple as saying you don't know something in your area. It's, it's not going to be easy. Yeah, yeah. No, no. So it's not a question of not doing it. While protecting the livelihoods and aspirations of those people who occupy that particular area, but to yeah. work with them and give them compensation for, for having contributed to the water supply of Bangalore, right? Right now, there's no contribution to them, right? So if, if suppose uh, an old growth forest or something is protected by people there, they could potentially be compensated so that they get an income out of it. As much as they do out of uh, giving it out as a home, a, what, a home stay or something. 
that's at one level. The second level is also to look at institution creation, right? The city has the power to think of river basin institutions. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, every one of the tribu tributaries of the Kaveri would have its own river basin institution, democratically elected, recognizing land uses, recognizing threats to the tributary and taking steps to protect it. And that payment of that money is required to put their plan into practice could also come from the major consumer of the water, which is Bangalore City, which has the capabilities of funding it, right? Yeah. Uh, Krishna, again, you raised your hand. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the question I had was, you know, uh, there was this big campaign of uh, saving Kaveri River, which uh, the spiritual leader Sadhguru had done about three, four years back. You know, the main agenda was to raise awareness, raise funds, and also, you know, do a lot of uh, tree plantation, some crores of trees uh, plantation was the plan over a couple of years, followed by shifting uh, people, I mean, the farmers from regular uh, agriculture to agroforestry and so on. And then I've seen some videos also, which uh, where farmers have spoken about how they've benefited, how their livelihoods have changed and so on. Um, so is that something which you think is a way forward do things like that are our so, campaigns like that needed across the country to save these rivers across the country there is generally a problem of rivers dying out so yeah, yeah. so but uh, you know any initiative which seeks to protect the river needs to be appreciated for the for the intent which it puts forward right now there have been criticisms that the complex problem of the river has not been understood and has just been uh, converted to tree planting, right, in farmer's field. Perhaps uh, there's a need to understand it more uh, from a more complex perspective and to improve on what is needed for the river itself, if the intent is there. See, trees by themselves in the first five years actually take away more water from the land than they actually provide, right? And so trees are not equal to forests. Old forests are different from plantations and agro um, forestry, right? So we need to understand that. And tree plantation, for example, in open scrubland or grassland is actually bad for them because it's not in tune with the biome. So all those factors have to be considered. And I'm sure that if there's a feedback mechanism which does a constant learning, and if the intent to help the farmers and to help the river is there, then we can do a, a lot more. And just an extension to that question, there was also this whole focus on saving the top level, the top layer of soil, because apparently they're losing a lot of this top layer soil and hence there is a, I mean, the, the agricultural yields are coming down consistently year on year. So there was a, along associated with this uh, saving Kaveri River, saving top level soil was also one more focus area. So just wanted to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, scientists have been long pointing out that uh, soil is degrading, uh, that the overuse of fertilizers and pesticides is rendering soil lifeless from a microbiome perspective, that organic carbon in soil is degraded tremendously in India. Soil no, no longer are able to grow as nutritious a crop as they used to before. Even the, you know, the regular vegetables don't have the same amount of nutrition as they had before. So it's again a complex set of reasons which is creating the soil conditions too deteriorate, which includes minimum support price for a certain types of crops and incentivizing farmers to grow certain crops, right, through interventions, as well as providing, let's say, electrical subsidy for groundwater extraction or providing free water for from canal irrigation or very subsidized water. All these are complex set of uh, problems. Of course, soil has to be protected. Uh, and soil has to be regenerated. And so there's something called regenerative farming, which is in, in, in entering the lexicon and people are looking at how to do regenerative farming. Again, and the, the thing is that we need to not simplify a message too much, right? Uh, it, it needs to be understood at the right level of complexity and the right level of engagement. Again, we need to take one baby step at a time and try and improve it. So the intent again will be correct. But the application on the ground will have to be more robust and more informed by what is the right thing to do. Any other questions? Haan, Apeksha, go ahead. Uh, so this is not uh, really about ka Kaveri. Uh, the central government has a very uh, very ambitious project of uh, uh, interlinking the northern and southern rivers. Uh, what is your take on that, sir? And uh, is it really possible? So one of the takes, as we see with the Kaveri Tribunal decision, is that there's no thinking on the environmental impacts, right? Uh, even large dams, like, for example, the proposed Mekedadu Dam, 
let alone the interlinking of river, seeks to position itself as a drinking water project to, to escape environmental impact assessment requirements, right? Now, we need to start to think that there is not enough water in it being transferred from one landscape to the other, that the demand will completely outstrip supply. Suppose we grow sugarcane with the water in a dry desert, right? You can take all the river waters of India and put it into Rajasthan in the desert. And if you grow sugarcane there, that will still not be enough, right? So we have to first ask the question, what crop should we grow in what area? Whether it actually fits in there and whether there's enough water for it or not. And then talk about diversions of river. Every river diverted means a loss of biodiversity. It means impacts not only in the river stretch itself, but in, even in the sea that it reaches. And that is very less understood. As I was showing you, the Hilsa, for example, has disappeared without us even noticing it. Like that, many species of fish would have disappeared. And we don't, we're not even aware of it. Do we want to value that biodiversity? Do we want to protect those biodiversity too, as and when we need it? So those are the critical decisions that we have to take. And in my personal opinion, I think interlinking of rivers is flawed with ecological consequences way beyond our imagination. Yeah, regarding that, there is also this this thing that anyway during the monsoons almost all rivers will be in spate, and during the dry seasons almost all the rivers will be uh, will have less water. So then, what's the point really in interlinking them? Because so rivers in spate excess water. So Uma, rivers in spate have actually been providers of silt and fertile soil to the plains. We are also learning now the dams, like for example the Metur Dam actually prevents silt from reaching the delta, the rich Tanjavur delta, where it would have been productively used. Now we've held it up in Metur, right? right. So spate and river flood, or rivers flooding is a natural process of regenerating the land. Yes. If you go and build in the floodplains, then it becomes a loss of life and a loss of livelihood. But if you protect the floodplains and use the river's productive phases, which comes from uh, you know, flooding and uh, dry season, then we are living more in tune with nature. So therefore, the concept of living with floods is also now entering the lexicon and more and more people are realizing that's the way to go. Uh, yes, go ahead, Tarakesh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, when it comes to the, uh, you know, uh, agriculture, where, uh, you know, we, we all know that uh, rice is, uh, you know, it will take, it will consume a lot of water. Uh, so I just came across uh, uh, from one of the YouTuber, Ganesh Prasad, who had uh, told that, uh, you know, these millets, growing millets and, uh, uh, you know, we Indians consuming millets more. Uh, could be one of the possible solutions. Uh, so do you think it is, uh, uh, you know, practical enough? Yeah, yeah. So we have to look at alternatives. Uh, we can't eliminate rice completely, but we can draw a balance between the small grains like bajra, jawar, ragi, and all other crops which are shown to be more nutritious. The only challenge is that we'll have to recognize the system which encourages the production of rice. If you have a minimum support price for rice, and if you give fertilizer subsidy, the farmer will only grow rice, right? So overall, we'll have to send signals now to the farmer so that his livelihood or her livelihood is increased, not just protected, but increased. Yet the consumer's uh, requirement of nutrition of good, healthy food is also met. So the consumer has to be persuaded. The farmer has to be persuaded through right institution and like the legal frameworks. So the solution for water crisis may will necessarily be part of the agricultural solutions that we find. We cannot write a water policy independent of a food and agricultural policy, independent of an energy policy, and independent of a forest policy. Unfortunately, all these policies are independently written. We need to figure out how they will talk to each other and make sure that we grow the right crop with the right remuneration for the farmer, mind you, and uh, the right nutrition for them. Again, it's not a simple solution of substituting rice with ragi, right? Go ahead, Sandeep. You had a question. You have raised your hand. Yeah, am I audible, Uma? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, now given the background of uh, bio being uh, in the field of sustainable architecture and also given the interest of so many Bangaloreans and out of Bangalore people who are interested in second homes or going out of this urban clutter, yeah. are is there a thinking along the lines of backward and forward integration by, by Biome as an architectural firm to tie up with responsible land aggregators so that uh, 
so that communities which focus on protection of the old growth forests or who are interested in growing native trees only uh, uh, could be encouraged or looked at as a positive as a, as a solution uh, or is it too much to ask for just one architectural firm to be thinking of no, Sandeep, first you're uh, asking the, absolutely the right questions. Two, you're asking the right questions to the wrong guy because I'm part of Biome Plus, not so much as Biome. But third, I would ask whether Sharad uh, and others, uh, Juhi, from your from the group, would want to answer Sandeep's uh, um, question. So, look, uh, I mean, we are working with such groups, but then those conversations are not easy. I mean, uh, see, these groups are trying to form communities, and communities come with their own dynamics. Not everyone who buys into these uh, communities or projects are with that mindset. Many look at this as, as a second moment. Then in those things, uh, the dynamics of the community are many times beyond the control. You do put in the frameworks, the developer or the promoter also puts in the framework, but then in the end, it's the people who are there on the ground who have to do it. We'll be there for a couple of years and get out. So, Sandeep, the intent and capabilities are there. It's a question of doing the right matchmaking with the right number of folks to be able to ground it so that people accept it, right, as the end consumers do, if I have to summarize Sharad a bit. If there aren't any other questions, then uh, we can wind this up. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you for a really very interesting session. And uh, thank you, everyone, for making the time to attend this uh, session. And uh, we'll be putting up the recording on our YouTube channel soon, hopefully. And uh, though you can share it with those uh, who have missed it because quite a few people registered for this. Uh, our YouTube channel is Biome Environmental Trust. Please subscribe to it and also turn on notifications so that you get notified whenever any video is posted. And please follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Biome Environmental Trust. Thank you so much. Thank you.